This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. Welcome to All In with Pastor Jordan Easley. Today's message is about to begin, and we invite you to prepare your heart and mind to hear an inspiring message from God's Word. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. And now from First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee, here's Pastor Jordan Easley. Welcome to this week's message. I'm Pastor Jordan Easley, and I am excited to share with you the latest installment of our series, Holy Land Highlights. Today, we're exploring the ancient town of Caesarea Philippi, a location that may not be as well known, but holds special significance in the Gospels. Now, I don't want to reveal the importance right now because I don't want to take away from the message, but join me as we uncover what makes Caesarea Philippi so special. Also, don't forget to stay tuned until the end of the message to learn about a special free gift. Now, grab your Bible and something to write on, and let's head to northern Israel together to discover another Holy Land highlight. I'm standing in the center of a place known in the Bible as Caesarea Philippi. When you read the Gospels, this was the furthest north that we see Jesus travel with his disciples. It's about 35 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. This trek would have been a major sacrifice and really a major time commitment in the first century. But I believe Jesus made this trek with his disciples because he wanted to ask one simple question in this specific environment. When I say this environment, I want you to understand that at the time of Christ, this place was established by the Greeks as a primary place of pagan worship. Within a stone's throw of where I'm standing, there were temples set up to worship several false gods and deities. This was the primary place where people would come to worship the fertility god Pan. During the time of Christ, there was an underground temple to the underworld where people would come and they would worship. And you can still see some of those ruins today. It was known as the Gates to the Underworld. And in that time, it was also known as the Gates of Hell, or maybe the Gates of Hades. The disciples would have been very uncomfortable being in this place. It was actually forbidden by many people in the Jewish community to even be here. But it was in this place where Jesus asked Peter in Matthew chapter 16, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In an environment where hundreds of people would have been worshiping false gods, Jesus looked at his disciples and he asked the question, who am I? And in that moment, he was saying, everybody's worshiping something. Everybody's worshiping someone. So who am I to you? Am I just a God, a little g God, or am I truly the Christ? And in this place, Peter made the confession, saying, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Today, I want us to consider that same question and contemplate the true answer. Who is Jesus to you? Is he just a good teacher, a great man, a miracle worker, a character in a really good book? Or is he the son of the living God? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? Let me ask you one more time. Who is Jesus to you? You know, when I was a little kid, my favorite subject in school was lunch. Anybody else? And my favorite day of the whole school year was field trip day. I loved field trip day as a kid because that was the day where I got to get outside the walls of the classroom and I got to learn in a completely different way. Anybody else love field trip day growing up? Listen, it was great because you got to be outside, you got to be in a new environment, and you got to use all of your senses. You could see and you could touch and you could smell and, and you could really em embrace all of the different things to learn in a way that you couldn't do in the classroom. For me, I can remember as a small boy in elementary school looking through the Encyclopedia Britannica. How about that word right there? That dates us all, right? I can remember opening up my encyclopedia in school, 
And I can remember looking at an anteater trying to imagine what in the world that really was. And I, I would try to study and how does it move and, and how does it walk and how does it eat and how does it do the things that it's supposed to do. But it wasn't until my teacher brought us on a field trip to the zoo, I got to see the anteater in person. It changed my complete perspective. I can remember looking in that encyclopedia and, and thinking about the space shuttles that would go into the sky and into outer space. And I would try to imagine what that must have been like. But then I can remember going to NASA for the first time. And after being at NASA, seeing it and experiencing it, I understood it on a completely different level. Today from Matthew chapter 16, here's what we're going to see. We're going to see Jesus as the teacher taking his disciples on a field trip. Now, they weren't on a yellow dog school bus with green vinyl seats and no AC. They were walking through the desert about 35 to 40 miles from the Sea of Galilee to the northernmost part that we see Jesus travel, a place called Caesarea Philippi. By the way, 35 to 40 miles doesn't sound much to us, but for them, that meant a two to three day journey through the desert. It was a difficult trek. There weren't convenience stores on the way to their destination. They had to pack it up and go. But the destination to Jesus was worth it. See, Caesarea Philippi is at the base of Mount Hermon. And it's known in the first century as a major hub for pagan worship. It was a place where people would go and people would show up. And they did it for one reason. See, people in that day would show up because they wanted to worship many gods. The god of Pan. And they would worship and they would make sacrifices at the sanctuary of Pan. There were actually many different gods that they could worship in this one place. But Pan was the main attraction. Pan, by the way, in Greek mythology, was a fertility deity who was also bestial. And if you don't know that word, that basically means that he had the upper body of a man, but he also had the hindquarters and the legs and even the horns of a goat. That name Pan came from the Greek word Panius, and he was considered to be the god of nature and the wild. He was also known to be the, the god of shepherds and flocks. And so people would show up from all over the place to this particular location so that they could worship and make sacrifices to this Greek god, and, and so they could gain favor from that god in these particular areas of their life. You'll notice the sanctuary that's pictured here uh, is made, it made it very convenient for a person to show up and worship and make sacrifices to many gods in this one location. As you can see right here in the courtyard, there were temples in this open courtyard of many different gods and, and worshiping many different things. In fact, when you look at the different temples that were represented, you have the temple to Augustus, which was built by Herod the Great. You also have the grotto of the god Pan, which is this huge cave behind here. And this huge cave was also referred to in that day as the gates of Hades. Have you heard that before? That's referred to as the gates of hell. You also have the court of Pan and the nymphs. And that's the open courtyard right here. Pan and the nymphs. By the way, in the English, that's where we get our word nympho. And so you can just use your imagination as to what happened in that location. You also have the temple to Zeus, which wasn't here at the time of Christ. It was built after Christ in the year 98 AD. You also have the court of Nemesis, which was the goddess of vengeance and justice. You have the tomb temple of the sacred goats. You had the temple of Pan and the dancing goats. There were a lot of goats involved in these different temples. But this was a hub for pagan worship. And not only did you have temples and statues and monuments, there would have also been people everywhere. So use your imagination. You can imagine just people flooding to this place and people are making sacrifices to these false gods and they're worshiping them. People were known for engaging with temple prostitutes in these open courtyards. Parents were known for sacrificing their children by, by casting their newborn babies into the river as a sacrifice. They were literally doing whatever they could, whatever they knew to do in order to please these particular gods. That was the scene as Jesus and his disciples entered the city. 
They were surrounded by gods and they were surrounded by deities and they were surrounded by people that were worshiping. They were worshiping every God known to man except for the one true God. Jesus was always a good teacher. If you agree with that, say amen. He was always a good teacher. And one thing that made him great, other than the fact that he's the son of God, was that he knew how to use a visual aid to communicate his message. For instance, in Matthew chapter 21, he used a fig tree to teach a a lesson on faith and prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus pointed to the birds flying into the sky, and he reminded his disciples how God feeds them and takes care of them. In John chapter 15, Jesus teaches a lesson about a vine and branches, and you can just see him pointing to them as he's teaching his disciples this principle of abiding in him. In Matthew chapter 9, he he used a field full of sheep to teach his disciples how the lost are like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus loved using visual aids in his teaching. And so now as we come to Matthew chapter 16, you can just imagine the massive visual aid that stood before them. It must have been amazing as they walked through the city gates and as they entered the courtyard that day, seeing all of the people and all of the, all of the worship and all of the temples in this pagan city. But that was the scene as they entered that day. Verse 13 says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? I believe this was the greatest field trip ever. And I say that because of four things that we see in this story. The first is the location. And we've already talked about that. We've already covered why it's so important. But understand, Jesus looked at his boys and he said, we're going on a long journey. And he took them on this long journey in order to get them to this specific location. It was in this location, Jesus wanted to have one conversation. And he had that conversation in Caesarea Philippi. So yeah, the location was a big deal. But second thing I want you to see in the story is the confrontation. There was a confrontation that happened in this passage. Look at it again in verse 13 and following. You see, Jesus not only loved using visual aids in his teaching, he also loved using questions in his teaching. He loved having these probing questions that got to the heart of the matter, especially with his disciples. And we see that in this passage. In verse 13, he starts out with a more general question. And he says, who do people say that I am? He's looking around and he's saying, who do all these people say that I am? And so he starts with a general question. But then as you keep reading in verse 15, he gets to a personal question, doesn't he? This is where he looks at his disciples and he asks this, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And what makes it even more personal than that is the fact that Jesus not only asked his disciples this question 2,000 years ago, the personal thing is he asked that question of us today. As we get kicked off today, I want you to think about this question. Who do you really say that Jesus is? We may not be surrounded by false deities in the form of golden statues or pagan sanctuaries today, but we are still surrounded by things that draw our attention or draw our affections away from God. Would you agree with that? You and I live in a world where Satan is working overtime to draw us away from God which means that we are still surrounded by idols that that we are choosing to make sacrifices to today. And we're choosing to give our best to today. We do this every single day. But that's the thing. Most of those things, we don't even typically think of them as idols, do we? we? We just think of it as life. Yes, we're being drawn here and we're being drawn there, but everybody is. It's just a, a way of life. Well, guess what? That was a way of life for them. The truth is, if we're giving our first to something, or if we're giving our best to something other than God, that by definition is an idol. So maybe you're asking today, well, what does modern day idolatry really look like? I I like how John Piper put it. He said, it starts in the heart, craving, wanting, 
enjoying and being satisfied by anything that you treasure more than God. As you think about those words, think about the things you crave, the things you want, the things you enjoy, the things you're satisfied by other than God. I mean, if that defines something in your life or in my life, we can call it whatever we want. But just know that God calls it an idol. He calls those things idols. Paul called it something different. He used the word covetousness, covetousness which is defined as a disordered love or desire, loving more than God what ought to be loved less, what ought to be loved less than God. That's covetousness. And so get this in your notes today. Covetousness is idolatry, and God calls idolatry sin. In fact, it's a big sin. It's one of the big ten. But here's what I realized today. I realized that before somebody can address their sin, they must first be able to identify their sin. So let me give you a few questions to consider today that may help you identify the idols in your life. These questions aren't original to me, but but they have been very helpful for me throughout the years. The first one is this. Do I love or treasure anything or anyone more than God? I mean, that's a big question that's going to point to some things in your life. The second question, do I prioritize anything or anyone before God? I mean, when you look at the priority list in your life, where does God fit? The third question is, does anything bring me more pleasure than the things of God? I mean, when we are a living life, there's a lot of things that bring us pleasure. There's nothing wrong with that. But where does God and the things of God measure up? and the things that bring you pleasure in your life. The fourth question, do I place my identity in anything over my status as a child of God? God says, man, that is your identity. Who are you? What defines you? Hopefully the thing that defines you is the fact that you were saved by the blood of the lamb and you're a child of the king today. But there's a lot of things that are competing for that title in your life. The next question, do I look to anything or anyone to meet my needs instead of God? There are a lot of different people that can meet needs, but where, do, where does God fit on the one you're looking to be the solution? The next question, do I seek fulfillment or satisfaction from anything outside of God? These are heavy questions with some big answers in our life. And the truth is we have a lot of different idols. We have a lot of different little G gods, little deities that are in all kinds of parts of our life. We worship idols related to success and money. Would you agree with that today? We we worship a lot of gods related to possessions and stuff. It's also very common to have idols related to personal identity and even physical fitness. Many have relationships that have crossed over that border into idolatry. Many romantic relationships are, are, are relationships where we are worshiping the other person. Many people have a relationship with their children that is unhealthy. Many parents worship their kids today. Would you agree with that today? There are a lot of parents that can't stand their kids, and that's a different message. But a lot of parents worship their kids. And and here's the thing. We've got to recognize that if we're going to address that. Here's what we can know. God is the giver of all good things. Amen? God is the giver of all good things. But we cannot forget that he's still God. And he refuses to be one of many gods in your life. Don't forget what it says in Psalm 37, 4. It says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. He says, take delight in him because he is the source of all good things. When Jesus and his disciples entered Caesarea Philippi, Jesus, being surrounded by so many idols and so many gods, looked at his boys and asked them one question. Who do you say that I am? In other words, everybody's worshiping something. Look around. Everybody's worshiping someone. And so he got to the heart of the matter and he asked them, who are you going to worship? He was saying, are you going to worship false gods and idols that cannot give you anything? Or will you worship me, the one true God who can literally give you everything? The location was important. 
The confrontation was important. But don't miss the third part, and that was the confession. You see, the confrontation led to a confession, and we see that between Jesus and Peter. When Jesus asked Peter the question, who do you say that I am? Peter gave his confession, and he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You know, some translations of the Bible actually read, you are the Christ. If, if it says Christ in your Bible, would you raise your hand? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Here's what I want you to know. In this passage, Peter uses the Greek word Christos, which is translated Christ or Messiah. Those two words are synonymous. And so when you say Jesus is the Christ, what you're really saying is Jesus is the Messiah. And when you say Jesus is the Messiah, what you're really saying is Jesus is the Christ. Both of those words are the same in the Bible, and they both literally mean the anointed. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. See, that was a title given prophetically to the coming deliverer all the way back in Isaiah 61.1. In that passage, it says, the spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. That word Christ or Messiah was his Hebrew name. And when Peter confessed saying, you are the Messiah, he was literally saying to Jesus, you're the one. You're not one of many. You're the one, the one we've been waiting for, the one we've been looking for. You're the Messiah, the Christ. And then he adds in verse 16, the son of the living God, the son of the living God. In that scene, he looked at him and he said, none of this matters. You're the one. You're the son of the living God. You're the one I'm putting my hope in and my trust in. You're different than any of these other gods. And notice before he had any time for his pride to swell up after making this great confession, after hitting the nail on the head related to who Jesus is and who Jesus was, he went on to say in verse 17, Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. You know why Peter got it right concerning who Jesus was? It's the same way you get it right. That verse says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father in heaven revealed this to you. See, only the Holy Spirit can show you that. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal the truth to you right now. Not, now, I can preach it, and I can teach it, and we can sing songs about it all day, but the Bible says flesh and blood can't reveal the truth to you, but my Father in heaven will reveal the truth to you. You say, man, how does God the Father reveal to us who God the Son really is? Well, the same way he re reveals the truth in our hearts and our minds today, it's, it's through the third person of the Holy Trinity. It's the Holy Spirit. Do we get that today? The Holy Spirit. A lot of times we, we don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit because we're, we're uncertain about all the things. We, especially in the Baptist church, I don't get it. We act like the Holy Spirit is the, the ugly stepsister of the Holy Trinity. He's not. The Holy Spirit is real and moving and active. The Holy Spirit is moving in this place today. And that's what the Bible says, that the Holy Spirit is the one who will reveal truth to your heart. It's the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened to Simon Peter that day. Don't miss this. In the heart, in the mind, and the soul of Simon Peter first came conviction through the Holy Spirit. And that conviction led to confession. The Holy Spirit convicted Peter of that truth. And through that conviction, he convinced him of the truth. And after being convinced of the truth, he was prepared to confess that truth to other people. And he does the exact same thing in our life today. First comes conviction from the Holy Spirit. And that conviction convinces us that he is worthy of our worship. He alone is worthy. And once we realize that he alone is worthy of our worship, and that conviction leads to us being prepared to confess that truth to other people. We miss this a lot in the church, and I don't know why. We miss the confession part. Confession is just as important as any other part of salvation. It's tied to our salvation in so many ways. In fact, look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That verse says, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
It says one believes in the heart, right there. That's talking about conviction. One believes in the heart, resulting in righteousness. And one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. You get it? It says it again in 1 John 4, 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. As I read the Bible, I notice time and time again how confession is a natural response to conviction. If you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit, convinced of the truth through who he is, you are then prepared and really expected to confess that truth to other people. You got the location, you've got the confrontation, you've got the confession, but don't miss the last part, y'all, and that's the proclamation. This whole thing builds up to the proclamation beginning in verse 18. It says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The proclamation was powerful that day. See, many people don't realize when they read that text that this was actually just a play on words. When you see Jesus say the words, you are Peter, it's almost kind of funny when he says that. He says, you are Peter, but he uses a Greek word here, the petros, which is used to describe a small rock, a little pebble, a fragment of a rock. Jesus looked at him in this moment. He says, you are Peter. You are little rock. But then when Jesus goes on to say, and on this rock, I will build my church, he uses a completely different Greek word for the word rock. He uses the Greek word petra, which is a word used to describe a foundational rock, an essential rock. You see it? He says, you are little rock. I'm building my church on the foundational rock. You can't forget why Jesus brought his disciples to Caesarea Philippi in the first place. He brought them on a field trip. He brought them so that they could have an object lesson. He brought them to see something, and he wanted to connect their vision to the truth. And so the vision before them is this huge rock, a massive rock of idolatry and sin and pagan worship. And so now he's going to connect that vision with the truth. And this is how he did it. He said, you are Peter. You are Petros. You are a tiny, small rock. You are a pebble of a rock. You are an unstable piece of a rock. But then he says, but on this rock, on this Petra, on this massive rock, on this foundational rock, on this mighty rock, what does he say? I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. You say, pastor, so what is this mighty rock that Jesus is building his church upon. Can I tell you? It's the exact same rock that the psalmist was talking about in Psalm 18, verse two. He says, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and a horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Do you see what he's talking about? He goes on to say in verse 31, David says, for who is God besides the Lord and who is a rock only our God? He goes on in verse 46 and he says, the Lord lives, blessed be my rock. The God of my salvation is exalted. Or how about in Psalm 19, 14, he said, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Listen, I can go on and on all day long. Put it down today. Jesus is the rock and he's building his church upon the confession of Peter where he said that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Let me put it all together for you real simply. You ready? Jesus is the foundation of his church. There's no other foundation. Look at the history of the church. You know why the church of Jesus Christ continues to thrive through years of persecution and abuse and conflict? You say, how does the church survive? How has it existed all these years? Let me tell you why. It's because of its foundation. The church is built on a sure foundation. Would you agree with that? The church is built on a solid foundation, a strong foundation, a steady foundation. I'm talking about the foundation of the person of Jesus Christ. 
And did you hear what Jesus said about that church in verse 18? He said, I will build my church. You say, man, I don't believe Jesus is the foundation of the church. Listen to these words again. I will build my church. He didn't say you will build my church. He didn't say you will build your church. And he didn't say I will build your church. What does he say? I will build my church. And notice, he uses the future tense in this passage. He said, I will build my church. Why is that? Because when Jesus said these words, his church was still in the womb. His church wouldn't be born until the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and came to stay. In fact, we can find the charter members of that first church in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. When you think of the church, what picture pops into your mind? Like if you're just having a conversation and you're thinking about the church, what do you think of? Here's what I want you to know. The church that Jesus builds isn't a church that's made of brick and mortar. You never see that. It's not a a brick and mortar facility. It's not a location. The church that Jesus builds is a church that's made up of people. People that have come out of darkness and stepped into the light. People who have repented of their sin and have been born again. The church is a church of people that that strive to walk with God and worship God and live for the sole purpose to build the kingdom of God. You know, someone once said, "The, the church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is a people. And now for 2,000 years, Jesus has been building his church, one believer at a time. May I ask you a personal question today? Are you truly a part of his church? Can you look at your own life, your own experiences, your own relationships, and say that I am 100% certain that I am a part of his church? Because if you are a part of his church, I've got some good news for you. Notice what Jesus says in verse 18. He said, for those of you in his church, listen, the gates of Hades will not overpower his church. The gates of Hades, he's he's pointing to a cave, but he's talking about something much greater. And he's saying that the devil can't do anything to stop the progress of my church. You see, our fight today is not with liberal agendas. Our fight today isn't with politicians in Washington, D.C. Our fight today is not against people on the other side of the aisle. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Do we get that today? However, we are still in a fight. The church, us, we are still in a fight. Don't forget, we have a real enemy today. An enemy that roams around like a roaring lion, like it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, looking for anybody that he can devour. And he would love to devour some of us today. But don't forget, we not only have a real enemy today, we have a defeated enemy today, amen? We have a defeated enemy that was defeated on a bloody cross and defeated on an empty tomb. And that is what Jesus was talking about when he said the gates of Hades will not overpower my church. The gates of Hades doesn't have the power to overcome you. Man, what a blessing it is to know that we can be a part of his family, a part of his church. This was the field trip of a lifetime. Not only because of the location or the confrontation or the confession or the proclamation. It was the trip of a lifetime because of the conversation that he includes us in. And he points to our life today and he asks the question, who is Jesus to you? In other words, do you truly believe that Jesus alone is worthy of your worship? Do you truly believe that Jesus alone is worth it? worth pointing your heart to and your life to, worth pursuing more than you pursue anything else? Is he worth you putting your idols on the shelf and saying, God, from this point forward, I will worship you and you alone. 
That doesn't mean that you can't have fun or can't participate in other things, but it means when it comes to your heart's affections and your desires and your priorities and your life, your heart is connected to the heart of, of a living God. And if you can't say that your heart is connected to his heart today in relationship, I pray that today would be your day of salvation and surrender. Let me ask you, who is Jesus to you? Is he a good man, a good teacher? Is he a popular character in a really well-known book? Or can you look at Jesus today and say, no, you know what? He's my savior and he's my Lord and he is the son of the living God. He's the one I place my hope in and my trust in and my faith in and I love him more than anything else. That's my prayer for us today, that we can look at him and say, he is my everything. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Can you say that he is your everything? Can you say that today? Lord, if we can't say it, I pray that today is the day. Lord, that we will surrender our lives to you, that we would pursue you. And God, I pray that you would move people, move them in their spirit, move them in their life, move their hands and their feet into your direction so that they can be holistically children of the one true king. God, give them wisdom and power and strength as they turn away from sin and turn to you and trust you as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for many, but also a day of surrender for others. God, many of us know you. We have a relationship with you, but you are not our one and only God. God, allow us to identify the idols in our life. Thank you for including us in this journey and allowing us to pursue you even today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a deep passion for exploring the Holy Land. No matter how many times I've been, I never get tired of immersing myself in the sights, the sounds, and the sacredness of each location in Israel. In this series, my aim is to take you on a virtual journey through the Holy Land, recognizing that not everyone can physically travel there, especially during times of conflict. If you've enjoyed this sermon, I'd like to offer you a free, no obligation devotional inspired by the Holy Land Highlight series. This devotional provides further insights from the sermons and helps you dive deeper into the Word in connection to the sites that we've studied. Simply follow the on-screen instructions to request your free devotional right now. It'll be sent to you promptly while supplies last. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm keeping you in my prayers, and I cannot wait for our next time together right here at All In. Hey, we never want to end our broadcast without giving you the opportunity to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you'd like to make the decision to trust Jesus and want to know more about what it looks like to follow Jesus, get in touch with me right now. Follow the instructions at the bottom of the screen so that we can pray for you and also put information in your hands right away. Today, we celebrate your decision and look forward to being a part of your personal journey of going all in with Jesus Christ. This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. We hope today's message encourages you as you strive to live your life fully committed to Jesus Christ. Thank you.